morning, everyone. Um, it's really nice to be here. Thank you very much for having me in to speak with you. Um, it's a great opportunity, I hope, for me to learn a little bit about what, uh, what's going on in, in your corner of the industry. Um, I'm a farm kid. Uh, I grew up on a conventional small grains farm in Saskatchewan, so we were just east of Humboldt. Um, and so farming is in my bones, I guess. Um, I, unfortunately, my flight was delayed yesterday, so I have only arrived at the end of the day, so I feel a little bit sort of out of sync with what you've been talking about um, since you got here, but uh, I hope that what I've got to say this morning will be interesting for you. So the title of the talk is Growing Your Organic Matter for Improved Productivity and Sustainable Soil Use. So my research program um, sort of has three themes, microbial carbon stabilization and destabilization, so understanding how soil biota form organic matter, how they decompose organic matter, um, and what that means for soil fertility and how management and climate impact those interactions. Um, I also do a lot of work with soil nitrogen cycling, greenhouse gas emissions, so I have some students working on trying to understand nitrous oxide emissions from cropping systems, um, and a bit of work with plant microbe interactions because, of course, microbes and plants have evolved together and they have a lot of really remarkable and fantastically synergistic relationships. So thinking about soil organic matter, um, when I think about soil organic matter, I, immediately what comes to mind is that smell of freshly rained on soil, that wonderful earthy smell. Um, in fact, that's not soil organic matter. That, that scent has a, a name, it's called petrichor, but the, the scent itself comes from geosmin and it's created by streptomyces, a, a genera of bacteria in the soil. Um, but I think that when I think of soil organic matter, I sort of think of that coming to life, of, of um, all of the biology that's going on below ground that we don't see but we know is so important. So soil organic matter itself provides a lot of really critical uh, functions. It promotes good soil structure, so still, uh, good tilth, um, porosity, um, it promotes good infiltration and drainage and it can help to mitigate compaction. Um, it's really critically important for aggregate formation and stability, and of course, aggregates are really important microhabitats for soil organisms. They live there and, and um, perform a lot of important services like nutrient cycling within aggregates. Um, aggregates also serve to protect organic matter and keep soil carbon in, in the soil. Soil organic matter regulates soil moisture availability, so it acts like a sponge, and through its um, ability to increase or improve soil porosity and water infiltration, in that way regulates water flows through the soil. Um, it's critically important for nutrient cycling in a number of ways, which I think we'll talk about um, as we go through the, the presentation this morning. Um, and it's an important regulator of climate, both through its role in car soil carbon storage, but also in how it impacts greenhouse gas emissions like nitrous oxide and methane. I'm a soil microbiologist, so when I really um, get my, my hands dirty with soil organic matter, what I'm primarily thinking about is how it's a source of nutrients, both for plants and for microbes, but also a source of energy that drives below ground processes. So I think of carbon as a molecule that carries energy, just like hydrocarbons carry energy to be, uh, to, to have a simple analogy. So microbes are feeding on soil organic matter because they use those carbon molecules, they digest them, they extract energy from them, and they breathe them out as carbon dioxide, just like we do. Some of the carbon gets built into their biomass, and that's great because that carbon is, is highly, or more highly stabilized in the soil. Um, and some of it, like I mentioned a minute ago, they breathe out and it gets returned to the atmosphere and then so on, the cycle continues. So really, soil organic matter is important because it provides resilience. Resilience to biotic and abiotic stresses like drought, like short-term nutrient deficiencies, um, and a host of other um, stresses encountered in our cropping systems. Soil biota, or sorry, soil organic matter um, supports soil biota. So it's not just um, food for the microbes, it also um, promotes um, aeration, it promote, or promotes water availability, it's shelter, so it's their home. Um, and then as we'll talk about a lot today, it's the source of energy and carbon for their growth. This is really important because soil biota perform a number of critical ecosystem services. Decomposition and cycling of organic matter, which is primarily what we're here to talk about today, is a really important one. 
regulation of nutrient availability, so sort of um, putting valves on the flows of nutrients through soil so that hopefully we have good synchronized timing between um, plant uptake and nutrient availability. Microbes suppress disease and pests. They maintain soil structure and hydrology through their interactions with the soil matrix and, and soil organic matter through decomposition. They regulate gas exchange and carbon storage, as I mentioned a minute ago. They detoxify the soil, so they break down contaminants. Um, hydrocarbons is a good example of that. Long chain carbon molecules, microbes can break them down and utilize that carbon for their own growth. Um, and finally, plant growth control. So there are a number of management practices that promote um, healthy, diverse microbial communities. Continuous cropping is one. Um, plants are the primary source of new carbon, like we'll talk about in a minute. And so the, um, having a, plants on the land as long or as much as possible just um, creates a steady food source for microbes. Reduced physical disturbance slows down decomposition. Um, and holds soil organic matter in the soil where we want it. Uh, diverse cropping rotations, we'll talk a little bit about a research example of that later. Balanced nutrient management, organic amendment application, cover cropping and the use of inoculants all contribute to increased microbial, or typically increased microbial biomass and improved soil function. So I like to use the analogy that um, when we're studying microbial communities, we often talk about the size of the microbial community, the composition and diversity of the microbial community, and its activity. Um, the size of the microbial community, you can kind of think of like, a, like the biological engine below ground. So the larger the engine, the more capacity there is to drive biological processes when and where they're needed. Diversity is a little bit uh, trickier concept to capture in the microbial world because you may have heard that in every teaspoon of soil there are billions of microorganisms and tens of thousands of different species. So with tens of thousands of different kinds, I mean, in a plant community we can say, okay, a diverse plant community with 10 species is likely better than um, a monoculture with one, but what does it mean when we're talking about thousands or, or tens of thousands of different kinds? And so I like to think about it sort of like an insurance policy. Uh, microbial diversity translates to microbial functional diversity, which means that at any given time there is probably one or more populations capable of performing any given function. If we take uh, nitrogen cycling, uh, making nitrogen available from organic nitrogen sources as an example, um, that nitrogen mineralization process is something that we need um, certainly through all of the um, growing season and really year round. And so there might be a population that performs nitrogen mineral mineralization optimally when um, temperatures are low. Um, but as temperatures, imagine this environmental gradient increase, that population might slow down and another will take over. And this is the idea of how diversity links to, um, to insurance. We have functional redundancy or different populations capable of performing critical processes under a suite of environmental conditions, wet, dry, warm, cold, um, abundant resources, um, uh, stringent resource availability. So returning back then strictly to talking about organic matter, where does it come from? In agroecosystems, new carbon comes into the soil from plants. Um, and sometimes organic amendments. So plants take energy from the sun and carbon dioxide from the air and they fix it through photosynthesis into their tissues. So they build organic carbon, which most soil microbes um, use as their food and energy source. So the energy then held by plant tissues in their above and below ground biomass is really energy that's fueling the whole below ground system and driving other really critical, important processes. So just as a very simple example of that, this is some work done by a former master student of mine, Sarah Kuzmik, um, in a really neat long-term experiment that is um, at Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada in Lethbridge. So this particular experiment was established in 1910 when the research station first opened. Uh, researchers there wanted to um, understand at the time what was the impact of, of fallow frequency on wheat productivity. So you can imagine that in 
1910, soil fertility in the inherent native prairie soil organic matter was quite high, and their primary concern then was actually soil moisture. So what is the impact of cropping frequency on soil moisture as it supported wheat growth? So they established this long-term experiment that looked at um, wheat cropping um, intensity, and so they had three rotations, A, B, and C. So you can see by the name of the experiment, it's called rotation A, B, C, quite obviously. Um, in our work, we looked at two of these rotations, A, which has been continuously cropped to wheat every year since 1910, and C, which is in a wheat-wheat-fallow rotation. So really, the scientific question from a microbial standpoint here was, what is the impact of having a crop on the soil every year compared to leaving it fallow one-third of the time? And so the bar chart on your right um, is just microbial biomass. We measured this using a molecule called phospholipid fatty acids, which I um, learned yesterday some of you are familiar with. And so um, the green bars represent the wheat-wheat fallow system and the blue, the continuous wheat system. Um, as production agriculture uh, progressed throughout the 1900s, researchers like producers recognized that soil fertility was declining and so in the late 60s and early 70s they superimposed a fertility experiment on this and they added either no fertilizer, um, phosphorus only, nitrogen only, or the combination of the two. And so what we're looking at here is, is a factorial experiment of cropping intensity and fertilizer addition and its impact on microbial abundance. So what you can see, the message here really, is that in every case, those blue bars, or in continuous wheat, had higher microbial biomass than the wheat-wheat fallow system. Um, and this is because more carbon is coming into the system. We don't have that carbon deficit one out of every three years during the fallow period. Originally, this was a, a tilled fallow system and then um, eventually became a chem fallow system. But in any case, it's the impact of not having all of that photosynthetic carbon or food coming into the soil for the microbes. So you need to feed the bugs. And even though I wouldn't call these soils healthy, I mean, in what case would you ever grow wheat for 100 years with only nitrogen or phosphorus or, heaven forbid, no fertilizer at all, um, you can see a really clear uh, effect of simply plant carbon inputs on microbial abundance. What's remarkable to me, actually, is this no fertilizer for 100 years, still has reasonably high microbial biomass and in fact does produce some wheat, which is quite amazing when you think about it. All right, so coming back to this idea of where does the carbon come from. So like I mentioned a minute ago, plants um, take energy from the sun and CO2 from the atmosphere and they build it into their tissues through photosynthesis. Those plant shoots or crop residues and root materials um, get incorporated into the soil, microorganisms decompose them, um, and that builds soil organic matter. In the process of decomposition, microbes breathe out some proportion of that carbon as CO2 and return it back to the atmosphere. Um, I like to put this poem up there. It was written by John Updike in the 1980s, um, and it's called Ode to Rot, and I've pulled a quote from it, but it says, let there be rot, and hence bacteria and fungi sprang into existence to dissolve the knot of carbohydrates photosynthesis achieves in plants. Dead matter else would hold the elements in thrall, nitrogen and phosphorus. And so it's not all, decomposition is certainly not all about carbon. Carbon is for most soil microorganisms, the source of energy and the molecules that they build into their own biomass using the carbon from plants, but it's also about cycling of phosphorus, nitrogen, and other critical elements. But not all soil organic matter is created equally, and so I've um, shown here a figure that was recently published by Jocelyn Lavallee um, in a popular media article actually talking about how soil organic matter is not created equally. And so this comes from a model out of um, Francesca Catrufo's group in Colorado. And what it shows is that um, soil organic matter can be fractionated into functional kinds of soil organic matter. And the model that they use um, has two different functional kinds of soil organic matter. One is called particulate, and you can think of it like those, the, the, the visible plant bits that you can see in the soil, so the light and fluffy, partially decomposed plant matter. Um, the mineral associated organic matter is carbon that's actually been sorbed to nutrients. And so microbes are really important in 
this particular process of stabilizing soil organic matter because they take um, soil carbon or soil organic matter from the plant, they consume it, and then through the process of their metabolic byproducts and particularly their own dead biomass, they deposit it onto mineral surfaces and that chemical bond forms and it becomes really highly stable in soil. Um, it's a little bit tricky to see because the font's kind of small, but on this side of the figure is particulate organic matter. And so they say this is fast cycling organic matter. Um, and importantly, this box here indicates the carbon nitrogen ratio, which is an indicator of quality. Um, on the other side is that mineral associated organic matter. And you can see that this cycling um, sphere is smaller and intended to indicate faster, but also importantly that the carbon nitrogen ratio is narrower. So mineral associated, highly stabilized organic matter um, is thought to be of higher quality as well. And that makes sense because if we think about plant matter, it comes in at, um, with a really wide carbon nitrogen ratio, let's say 80 to one. Microbes who have a carbon nitrogen ratio of four to one, let's say for bacteria, or 10 to one for fungi, consume it and build their own biomass at a much higher quality, lower ratio of carbon to nitrogen. And then it's their necromass and byproducts that get stabilized. So it creates this really high quality, stable organic matter. So particulate organic matter is primarily protected within soil aggregates. So I said a minute ago that soil aggregates were really important habitats for microbes, and they are. Um, but they're also really important protection mechanisms for soil organic matter. So those bits of fluffy, partially decomposed plant matter get trapped in aggregates um, by bonding with, or by, um, it's called the sticky mesh bag theory, where roots and fun fungal hyphae and microbial exudates create this sort of sticky mesh that traps things. Inside that protected habitat, then microbes have this um, really uh, chemically and physically diverse mini environment. And it's in there that it's thought that they um, take particulate organic matter and actually stabilize it further into mineral organic matter. Sorry. So the, the primary, primary protection mechanism for the light, fluffy, fast cycling organic matter is physical protection. Microbes can't get it, so they cycle it more slowly. On the other hand, mineral-associated organic matter is protected by chemical bonding. So you can imagine that the impact of different management practices on this stable versus less stable organic matter would be quite different because some are physically protected and others are chemically protected. Um, and so I put this up here um, because when I think about microbial carbon cycling, a diagram like this comes to mind, and the details aren't relative, but are relevant, pardon me, but the complexity certainly is. We know that below ground um, trophic systems, for example, and microbial soil plant microbe or microbial soil plant interactions are really complex. Um, but at the end of the day, soil organic matter storage is really about inputs and outputs. If you want to store more carbon, you either need to increase the incoming amount of carbon or decrease the amount of decomposing. Um, and the agent for decomposition, of course, are the microbes. So it's through management manipulations where we increase either the amount or the kind of incoming plant matter and decrease the amount of decomposition that we change both soil organic matter quality and quantity in the soil. So there are really three major destabilizing factors for soil organic matter. What speeds up its breakdown. Um, so for that particulate organic matter, it's largely released from aggregates. So tillage is a very big factor in regulating how soil organic matter is stored. <clears throat> Things like wet dry and freeze thaw cycles are also really important for disrupting aggregates and, and exposing protected organic matter. Um, a second important mechanism is the desorption from minerals. So that's breaking of those chemical bonds that have protected it on the clay surfaces. Um, and that primarily happens through changes in soil pH or increases in soil moisture. Uh, less directly related to management, um, but, but also um, can be impacted by the management and particularly climate um, factors that impact soil organic matter. The last one is really where I spend most of my research time thinking, and that's increased biotic metabolism. So of course, microbes are the agents of rot. <clears throat> 
Um, the quality of incoming litter changes their activity. Um, the uh, quality of the soil organic matter already present can impact how they break down crop, um, crop residues. And a really important one is microbial carbon use efficiency. So this, I think, is where nudging below ground systems from a microbial standpoint might be really important for improving soil fertility through impacts on soil organic matter because not all microbes use carbon with the same efficiency. Some um, are more efficient than others. So you can imagine for every 100 molecules of carbon, if a microbe can retain 60 of them, you're in much better shape than if it only retains 20 and, and breathes the way 80. And so all of these other factors come together to influence carbon use efficiency because they impact abundance of microbes, their activity, the community composition, as well as their ability to access carbon in the soil. So I'm gonna talk about a few research examples next, uh, but before I do that, I just wanted to run quickly through a tool that we use a lot. It sounds really quite sophisticated, um, and it certainly is very informative, but we, uh, it, it's, it's simple in principle. So we use this thing called a carbon-13 tracer, or a stable isotope. So normally when we think about isotopes, we think about radioactive isotopes and sort of human health implications and, 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 and um, things that you might not want to be handling in the lab. But we also have stable isotopes. Carbon-13 and nitrogen-15 are two very commonly one, two isotopes that are very commonly used in agricultural research. And so this carbon-13 stable isotope is just like a normal carbon molecule, but it has an extra neutron. That's important because it allows us to use it as a tracer. Natural C13 abundance is very low, so if we add a bunch of it, we can then follow carbon molecules flowing all over the ecosystem, which is a really, really powerful tool. We can trace it, um, as microbiologists, we can trace it directly right into the molecules that microbes are built from. So into their DNA or also into their microbial biomass, and we do that using phospholipid fatty acid biomarkers. So thinking then about um, factors that both stabilize and destabilize soil organic matter, I mentioned a minute ago that tillage is a really important one. So in this particular experiment, um, we set up microcosms in the field. So these are uh, not fancy, they're just PVC piping um, with soil um, and crop residues in them. So we grew, I forgot to mention a minute ago, um, we grew plants in this C13 labeling chamber. So we put in carbon dioxide that had that tracer molecule in it. And just through the normal process of photosynthesis, they then built that tracer right into their tissues. And we now have crop residues that have a tracer in them. So it's really, really useful for us because these are you know, metabolically important and also normal uh, feedstocks in soil. And we can add them and then trace how carbon cycling proceeds. So we did that. Oh, spoiler alert. We did that here. Um, we added barley residues, which had 10 atom percent tracer. So that means for every 100 molecules, 10 of them were, were the tracer. Um, we added them into these soil microcosms and either incorporated them right into the soil or left them on the soil surface. So this, was a, this experiment was a proxy for conventional versus or intensive versus no-till. Um, importantly, we go back every year since 2007 and add unlabeled crop residues so that we're not creating this weird situation where in 2007 we fed these soils some carbon and then they've been carbon starved ever since. So it's a really terrific resource from a research standpoint, but also very um, resource intensive. So colleagues of mine, Ben Ellert and Ed Gregorich, go around actually to 10 sites across the country and add these residues every fall. So it's a remarkable amount of work. Um, the take home here is that after two years, how much carbon remained of that barley residue? So if we look at this graph, we have uh, tilled on the right hand or left hand side and, and no till on the, on the right hand side. Um, and we have Ottawa and Lethbridge. So we did this in a wet, warm climate at Ottawa, and we did it in a cooler, drier climate at Lethbridge. Um, and what we found was that in the warm, um, humid climate, the difference, oh dear, sorry, the difference between 
incorporating residues and leaving on, on the surface was actually quite minimal in terms of carbon decomposition and how much of that barley residue remained two years later. But in the, the cooler, drier climate, oh my goodness, sorry, I'll figure this out sooner or later. Um, we saw a lot more carbon remaining where we left those residues on the surface. So we know this um, in, in Alberta and Saskatchewan, and I, I'm less familiar with the Manitoba context, but certainly in semi-arid environments, no-till does slow down decomposition and build soil organic matter. That's not always the case um, in warmer, wetter climates, and that's because temperature drives decomposition, so it accelerates residue breakdown, um, even when you leave it on the surface, and also that impact of higher moisture condition redistributes resources, including crop residues, uh, deeper in the soil profile without needing that physical action of mixing. Um, we also looked at microbial community structure in these soils. So we, um, in the first sort of measurements that we did, we saw, okay, well, if we leave residues on the surface, we, we slow down decomposition, um, we build microbial biomass, but does it change who's there and who's cycling things? Um, and so what this uh, figure represents is a fingerprint of a microbial community. Um, this is called an ordination graph, but in this particular kind of data, we took 100 molecules of phospholipids that represent a microbial community, and we put them through a statistical model that allows us to look at them in two dimensions. So you can imagine that if each one of these points had 100 factors, we would have no ability to wrap our brains around it. But instead, we perform this ordination, and we can now say each one of these dots represents the fingerprint of a particular microbial community. So when dots are close together in a graph like this, it means communities are similar to one another. When they're far apart, communities are dissimilar. So on the left, we have soil microbial community structure at Ottawa. The hollow symbols represent where we incorporated the residues, and the, the solid symbols represent um, soils where we left them on the surface. So we did see a shift in microbial community structure based on tillage and, and, and no tillage in Ottawa, but we saw a much stronger shift in the cooler, um, drier climate at Lethbridge. And so we have down here surface microbial communities um, and this is important because we know that in no-till residues stay on the, the soil surface, and so the most food is right at the surface, and it is most impactful on microbial activity and community structure um, at the surface because that's where all the food is. So we saw a big shift in the no-till system between zero to five and even just five to 10 centimeter um, communities. So there's a big difference in who's active, even just five centimeters below that that litter layer in the no-till system, more so even than the impact of conventional tillage. So <clears throat> tillage, or no-till, has changed residue decomposition rate, it's changed microbial community structure, and the question that we haven't answered yet is, does that change the actual composition of the soil organic matter? So different microbes have different metabolisms, and um, it is, hypothesized that therefore when they take the same kind of carbon and they process it, you might end up with two different kinds of soil organic matter, uh, but we're not there yet. Okay, so the next example is crop residue decomposition and what controls it. So this is actually just a larger version of the same experiment. So this spans a 3,500 kilometer gradient across Canada, reaching from Fredericton to, to the Breton research site northeast of Ed or northwest of Edmonton. Um, and the question we are trying to answer here is what controls crop residue decomposition across a wide variety of soil types and climates? Um, and in this case, we didn't do a no-till, uh, conventional till comparison. All of the residues were mixed into the soil, so that was a little bit different than the first example. Um, when we set up the experiment, by design, we chose 10 research sites that were very different, um, both in soil properties as well as climate. So we have, um, it's a little bit tricky to see here, but we have sand content all the way up to 85%, so very, very sandy soils, um, as well as organic carbon content ranging from less than 1% up to nearly 3 um, The the mean annual temperature spanned from two and a half degrees, uh, that would have been at Indian Head, and all the way up to 10 degrees at 
in southern Ontario. So a broad diversity of soil types, a broad diversity of both precipitation and mean annual temperature. Um, we, as I mentioned a minute ago, took these lit barley residues with the label built right into their tissues. We added them to soil microcosms, put those microcosms in the field, um, and then we went back and sampled them after six months, a year, two years, three years, and five years. And we asked questions about how much carbon is left and, and how did it look as those crop residues decomposed across this really broad diversity of agricultural sites. Um, <clears throat> so what we found was that um, less residues remained after five years in sandy soils. This makes sense because we talked a minute ago about how clay protects organic matter. So if you have less clay, you have less protection of organic matter, and we also know you have less aggregation. So those two really strong controlling factors on building soil organic matter are less, um, less functional in sandy soils. We also have less organic matter remaining in wet, warm climates because temperature and increased moisture accelerate decomposition. Uh, but we did have a pretty, thank you, a pretty um, reliable relationship looking at decomposition despite the fact that conditions were so very different at all of these sites. So here are our 10 sites, and this is the amount of carbon re remaining after X amount of time. So after six months, we can see we had anywhere from 60 to 80% remaining, meaning 20 to 40 was lost. Um, and by the end of the experiment, we across all 10 sites had somewhere between just under 10 and just over 20% of the residue carbon remaining. Um, so new carbon's coming in every year. It doesn't mean that we're losing carbon at these sites, but it just means of that carbon we added in 2007, by 2012, somewhere between 10 and 20% was stabilized in the soil matrix. Uh, but we wanted to predict residue decomposition, and we were still seeing a fair amount of variability across our sites that was um, uh, giving us a pretty decent predictive relationship, but not really telling us what was driving, how fast things are decomposing. So the next step then was to model this using something called thermal time. So rather than counting the amount of time that had passed, it was basically a, an exercise in counting the amount of, of warmth that had passed at these different sites. So you can see now our last sampling date was at five years, but we have nearly six years of thermal time at some of the very warm sites. And so this gave us a really strong predictive relationship. We can now, um, even across all of these diverse climates and soil types, quite accurately predict how fast residue decomposition will proceed. And it turns out it's almost all about temperature. Adding soil moisture to this model, somewhat surprisingly, didn't improve it much, which meant that either um, the way that temperature controls decomposition is really closely related to moisture, which is what I, I think, or that moisture is not that important. I'm not sure I buy that one. Um, so thinking about the the, the context and the impact of this modeling exercise, then what we can do is take future climate models and use them to predict future temperature regimes. And we did that, and what we found was that the time it took for residues to decompose to the point where they were 50% less was, was much faster. So one to four months faster. That's important because at current temperatures, they, they decompose to 50% in about a year. So we've accelerated things quite a lot. Uh, perhaps more importantly is the time it took to reach 90% decomposition um, was a, an entire year faster in our cooler, drier sites, but two years faster in the warm, wet sites. And so this has some pretty um, <clears throat> important implications if, in fact, we do see warming conditions because it means that soil organic or, sorry, decomposition of residues is going to accelerate and that we might have to start looking forward and thinking about how to keep soils cool as a means for preserving soil organic matter. Um, the next and last thing we did with this experiment was to ask the question, okay, we've added carbon-13, our tracer is barley residue, and we've seen decomposition proceed to the point where we have 10 to 20% of it left after five years. Um, but I said a minute ago, not all soil organic matter is created equally. So is there an impact <clears throat> of these different climate and soil types on the amount that gets stabilized and how much is, or where that carbon goes in the short and long term? So for this, we, we partnered with Francesca Catrufo's group who came up with this conceptual model. 
Um, and we fractionated soil just like they did in this particular modeling diagram. And then we looked at the amount of our label remaining after a given amount of time. So on the left-hand side, there's that particulate organic matter, or the fast cycling, um, reasonably readily available organic matter that gets physically protected in aggregates. <clears throat> the black bars are after six months, and the gray bars are after uh, five years. So on the left is that readily available fast cycling. On the right is the slower, more stabilized organic matter. And what you can see is that after six months, a lot of the residue from our, or a lot of the carbon from our barley was still in particulate organic matter fraction. But after five years, um, it had decreased significantly. So that's these gray bars here. So um, a lot of variability between our 10 sites. And I should say that they're stacked uh, from least sand to most sand. Um, going, reading from left to right. So you can see in the really sandy sites, not a lot of organic matter is protected. Um, and in either type of organic matter, less remains after five years. Um, in this particular case, we also wanted to say, well, what's controlling how much ends up as, you know, particulate organic matter in aggregates and how much en ends up as that high quality, stabilized mineral associated organic matter. And very similar to the overall total carbon um, modeling exercise, it was really all about temperature. So degree days above zero was the best predictive factor, but also soil organic carbon content at the beginning of the experiment. And so this is really a reflection of how much capacity does the soil have based on its climate and its inherent soil properties to store carbon. So those soils that were storing the most at the beginning were still storing the most at the end. <coughs> and clay was an important factor, but it didn't actually turn out to be significant in this model. So that's talking about um, how plant residues get converted into soil organic matter, and I hope the take home message was that temperature is really important for both the rate at which they decompose, but also the amount that remains behind, so we may need to be mindful of, of soil temperatures moving forward if we, if we do see changing climate conditions that impact soil temperatures. This next research example is about what about the quality of incoming carbon inputs? So um, does crop rotation diversity impact soil organic matter, the amount and, and the kind that is, is formed? So it's really based on the idea that crop rotation provides a balanced diet, and does that lead to improved soil fertility? Can we see signals of that in the microbial community? So this conceptual diagram on the right comes out of Stuart Grandy's group in the US, but they did a study in um, monoculture corn or a diverse corn cropping system, and so what they found was that they had increased aggregation in the diverse rotation, improved soil organic carbon, and um, total nitrogen. Uh, and improved soil fertility and productivity. So we wanted to ask those questions um, in Canadian systems. So we went back to two long-term rotation experiments at Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. The first is the new rotation experiment at Swift Current, it's called very creatively, the new rotation. Um, it was established in 1987, and it's continuous wheat versus a wheat canola wheat pea. Uh, the second experiment is called the Totten rotation, and it's continuous corn versus a corn winter wheat soy rotation, and it's at the Harrow Research Station in southern Ontario. Um, this is the work of Dr. Jennifer Town, who's a postdoc that has been working with me, so I just wanted to, to mention her because she's a really talented scientist and microbiologist, and this is, um, this is really her work. So these two different sites, we went in at different times during the, the growing season, and we that sampled the soil microbial community. So we went at what we call early vegetative, or just when the plants are in, in the early stages of vegetative growth. And this is thought to be really important for establishing microbial relationships throughout the growing season, so that's why we look at that particular state. Uh, we went back at anthesis, so when the wheat and the corn um, was flowering. Uh, and then we looked at soil microbial communities post-harvest. We looked at soil organic matter characterization, so how much lignin is there. Lignin is a, a relatively, um, I don't know, chewy kind of organic matter. It's low in nitrogen, it's challenging to break down, um, and so it's kind of a low quality organic matter. We looked at amino sugars, which is the dead bodies of microbes, so sort of a higher quality organic matter, um, and then as well at the available carbon. So if we just incubated these soils in the lab, 
how much carbon was available to just be respired by, by microbes without us manipulating the soils. We looked at various nutrient analyses, microbial enzyme activities, and we did a bunch of work with microbial community characterization using both DNA sequencing and phospholipid fatty acid profiling. So one of the questions when we started this was, was is above ground diversity reflected in below ground diversity? And so what we're looking at here is three different metrics of microbial diversity. Um, I mentioned a minute ago that putting, an, or a few minutes ago, that putting a number on the diversity of a community that has 10,000 different kinds of things is quite challenging. So this is the number of different things and their abundances collapsed into different metrics. The red dots are the continuous corn system. So through the next few slides, Red means continuous corn and wheat, and green, pink, and blue mean diverse rotations. So we're looking for differences between red and other colors, basically. Um, and what we can see here is there's actually surprisingly no significant difference in the diversity of bacterial or fungal communities in the corn, um, whether it was continuous corn or corn in rotation, which very much surprised us. When we looked at microbial community structure, however, we did see differences. And so you can see here that those red dots separate out from the green dots. Um, the space going vertically reflects those two different sampling times um, to some extent. And so we, uh, I forgot to mention ago that we, a minute ago that we looked at microbial communities in the soil, also in the rhizosphere soil, so the soil that's directly adjacent to the root and really highly impacted by, by the plant, and we looked at the root interior. And so in all cases, we saw impacts of uh, long-term continuous or um, rotation corn on microbial community structure. In the wheat system, similarly, we saw no difference um, in the continuous wheat versus the, the wheat, canola wheat pea. Um, in this case, the pink, or sorry, the blue and green symbols just represent the wheat that followed canola versus the wheat that followed pea, but in both cases, wheat in rotation. Um, looking at community structure, there was actually no clear impact at all. So this surprised us because we now have not seen a change in microbial diversity, nor a change in the microbial community structure because of this long-term cropping diversity. So that was a surprise. We did definitely expect to see that, you know, this more balanced diet would impact microbial communities. Um, the next thing we did was do another one of these ordinations where we took all of the different soil attributes, soil fertility properties and soil functional properties, and we put them into a single fingerprint. And what clearly popped out at us here was that even in swift current where we didn't see a reflection of um, the rotation impact in the community diversity, we definitely saw a clear separation of how soils were functioning. So nutrient cycling, nutrient availability, soil organic matter uh, properties were all different both in the corn and the wheat systems. And so I think that even though we didn't see a signal that was clear in the microbial community, we see a really clear impact here that crop rotations were um, resulting in very different soil function than, than the monoculture cereals. And this is what we expected to find. Um, so I said that we looked at soil organic matter quality. This is just the amount of lignin, so that chewy, um, low quality soil organic matter. And you can see in both the wheat system and the corn system, lignin was higher in the monoculture cereal. And so that is not a good thing. It tells us that uh, lower quality that, that the carbon remaining after decomposition is of lower quality. And that makes sense because we're, I mean, the feedstock is wheat or corn only. And so I think we're losing a bit of the balance that, that healthy functioning microbial communities need to see. Um, <clears throat> the other thing that we saw was an impact on just mineralizability or availability of carbon. So it was lower in the continuous corn system than in the diverse rotations. We had a bit of a, uh, disparity here, which was wheat after pea. I'm not sure why that wasn't different than the continuous, um, continuous wheat system, but um, we're, we're still looking into more attributes of the soil organic matter to try to understand that. Um, so the take home here then is that uh, crop rotation affected primarily nutrient cycling, to some extent microbial community composition, and definitely soil organic matter composition, and it was stronger in the corn system than the wheat. Um, within the corn system, where we did see strong impacts on the microbial community, they were greatest in the soil, 
but less in the rhizosphere and the root. And I think that's because the plant has a lot of its own resources and so it can recruit organisms, certainly to its root interior, but also into the rhizosphere, um, despite changes in um, soil organic, or soil fertility and soil organic matter quality. The really important part is that in both of these rotation studies, the long-term yields were significantly higher in um, the, the high diversity rotations. And so <clears throat> the plant organic or plant matter quality is definitely reflected um, in soil fertility. And so sometimes we saw it reflected in the microbial community, other times not. But in terms of how soils were functioning, I think we had healthier, higher fertility soils in the diverse rotations as reflected by yield. The last thing I'm gonna talk about is roots. So we just talked about the importance of um, plant matter quality, incoming plant matter quality for both soil organic matter formation and microbial communities. What's the deal with roots? The thing about roots is that one, they're, we don't see them so often we discount their importance, but they can contribute 80% as much carbon below ground as the above ground residues. So they are very important. Um, and there's emerging evidence actually that root carbon is preferentially stabilized, so that microbes shuttle it into that stable pool uh, preferentially, partially because of root carbon quality and also because of its proximity to mineral surfaces in the soil. Roots explore the soil volume very well, and so they're sort of in a microbial habitat next to clay particles more often than, than residues that are um, at least originate at the surface. The other thing about roots, of course, is rhizodeposits. And so rhizodeposition can account for anywhere between one and 10% of the total plant photosynthate. Um, the range of numbers here is very broad um, and differs a lot between crop types and cropping systems. I put this picture up here. It's just, um, this is corn mucilage. It's a really sort of often used picture in the research, but you can see all of that gooey, glossy, starchy, mucilage and, and it helps you visualize what might be going on next to an, a root exterior um, below ground that we can't see. So root carbon has high quality rhizodeposits. It also has structural carbon, so the, the things like cellulose and hemicellulose that, that are part of above ground biomass that also um, build the below ground root biomass. But that rhizodeposit carbon is really quite high quality and attracts enormous microbial diversity. And so I think it's a combination of both exploration of the soil volume, but also differences in soil quality, or sorry, pardon me, carbon quality that, that are leading to preferentially stabilized root carbon. But um, as an entire research, well, a lot of the research community is just now heading down that, that road. So thinking about how so not all soil organic matter then is created equally, can we use plant roots as a means to improve um, so not only soil organic carbon storage, but soil organic matter quality? So is there a way that we can either manipulate and manage our cropping systems or even tweak our breeding programs so that plants are better able to put more carbon below ground without sacrificing yield? Can we? Can we monkey a little bit with photosynthesis and, and shift those ratios a little bit? Because I think it would be potentially um, a good tool for um, helping to promote below ground carbon storage, which also promotes microbial abundance and diversity and improve nutrient cycling. So going back then to where we started, um, organic matter uh, is formed and and decomposed as a function of microbial activity. It supports biota by providing habitat, water, um, air, and most importantly, a food and energy source. And so anything that we can do to build soil organic matter, generally speaking, results in improved microbial functioning. The very last thing I wanted to mention is that as a soil microbiologist, the kind of research that I do often looks at how microbes are cycling nutrients in the soil. Um, but another really important role that they play, of course, is through their interactions with their plants as hosts. And so just like we talk about the human microbiome, the plant microbiome is critically important to its health and functioning. And it makes sense because if you think about a microbial community with tens of thousands of different species in it, think of all of that genetic and metabolic capacity to sort of 
um, respond to signals below ground. And so it really, the microbial community that associates with the plant actually becomes sort of like a secondary genome to the plant. It's got its own genes and its own ability to respond to conditions, but uh, this entire um, really remarkably diverse and metabolically, um, metabolically diverse second genome that enables it to also respond further to, um, to stresses or even opportunities. So with that, I'll just acknowledge my Agriculture Canada collaborators, um, Drs. Craig Jury and Laurie Phillips at Harrow, who run the long-term corn system, um, Mervant St. Luce and Kelsey Brandt, who run the wheat system at Swift Current, Dr. Ronald Lemke, who's a colleague and a close collaborator of mine in Saskatoon, um, research assistants Stephen and Min, and, and some uh, really great undergrads that we had that were involved in the work with the, the crop rotation system, Ryan, Veronica, and Kyle. Um, Last, I'll just thank, this is uh, some of the members of my research team. They're, what, they're, they're the folks that keep this fun every day. It's really fantastic to see all of their good work. Um, and with that, I'll just thank you and take any questions. Um, did you find the correlation between organic matter in the soil and the availability of phosphate for the plant? Um, we actually found, interestingly enough, in that rotation system, higher phosphate in the monoculture, and I think that was a function of the amount being exported, rather than a more healthy phosphorus cycling availability, or ability. Um, so, particularly in the corn system, phosphate built up like crazy, and I think it's a bit of an artifact of the experimental design. They add an amount of nitrogen and phosphorus every year. Um, that difference was less pronounced at Swift Current, where they add nutrients based on soil test. So I think they had a decoupling in Harrow in their corn systems of actually phosphorus excess, where they were adding far more fertilizer than was needed based on the yield coming out of the continuous corn. So we didn't see that signal that you were suggesting. We actually saw the opposite, but I think in a, in a well-managed product, or a, a differently managed and better managed production system, we may have seen um, improvements to soil phosphorus cycling. Um, no. So we've, we've been concentrating on regenerative principles, having plants grow from snow to snow and having those living roots grow. Mm -hmm. um, Sokol wrote a paper and suggested that the root exudates contribute two to 13 times more to the soil organic carbon than yeah. the, the plant roots and that the shoots are relatively insignificant. And, um, and if you zero till, those tend to stay on the surface anyway. With a little bit of tillage, they actually could be incorporated and be better microbial food. Um, some people have criticized Gabe Brown for saying it's almost impossible to go from 1.7 to 5.7 in 10 or 15 years. But if you use that model where you, in a monoculture, we only use plant growth for maybe 60, 70, 80 days versus say 180 days, and we over yield by diversity by say 1.5 times. So we potentially have three times more root growth in a season than a monoculture. Mm -hmm and then we use Sokol's number of two to 13 times, then do you think Gabe Brown has a good number? And can we duplicate that? Oh dear, I don't know. Um, my deficiency as a soil microbiologist is that I default to processes. Um, and so I did put that, that figure up there of N minus out equals storage. So, I mean, you can pencil it in a way where, I mean, if you want more soil organic matter, you gotta put more in or you gotta let less out. And so roots are looking to be a very important mechanism of doing it. And it was, in fact, Noah Sokol's paper that I was referring to, um, and one actually written by Rassi many years ago now, um, that says, we think root carbon is being preferentially stabilized and stored. Um, you're putting more carbon in because the plants are photosynthesizing for a much longer part of the growing season. And so it does make sense that, that is a mechanism for building organic matter from a microbial standpoint and from a 
like back of the envelope in minus out, but in terms of putting a number on it, it's not my expertise, so I'd hesitate to wade in and, and have an opinion on somebody else's recommendation. But. It's working. Um, I'm from Europe, and it's always a discussion, what is no-till? Yeah, we are always talking about no-till or minimal t minimum tillage. So what is your definition in this research? Um, I did my PhD on microbial community dynamics in no-till systems, and in that particular case, they were research trials, so it was strict no-till and conventional till, whatever that meant at the site. So the four sites that I looked at were um, in the brown, dark brown, black, and gray soil zones, so tillage intensity basically increased with that gradient. Um, it's all about tillage intensity. So the more intensive physical disturbance you have, the more you accelerate decomposition. Um, there are times when no-till doesn't functionally work. And so it may not be the healthiest thing for the soil, and I wouldn't propose that it would be. Um, certainly decreasing physical disturbance slows down decomposition. And so remembering that every time a microbe turns over carbon, it respires some of it away. Um, tillage tends to um, nudge carbon decomposition towards what we call copiotrophs or R strategists who aren't particularly efficient at carbon cycling and so we lose a higher proportion of CO2. So reduced tillage is probably a better term to use in, when thinking about how to impact decomposition processes and slow it down and build soil organic matter. In this experiment, our no-till conventional till was already a proxy because it was happening in a microcosm, but it was mixed into 10 centimeters versus left on the surface. Um, I don't know if I can phrase this question really well, but uh, it has, is there much evidence or benchmarking evidence on uh, native prairie systems that would be relevant to cropping systems? And I guess, sort of a, a simple follow-up to what David was talking about in terms of the uh, grazing systems that Gabe Brown is using and the people in regenerative agriculture talking about, uh, it's, it's kind of intuitive that perennial deep-rooted plants are going to store and build more carbon, but in our, in our systems when we're trying to extract annual crops, we can still use perennials and we can rotate in livestock, but you know what, I guess, a, can we benchmark those livestock grazing systems and, and native prairie and, and glean anything of value that is relevant to our, our cropping systems and organic farming because uh, there's, there's some conflicting messages, I guess, in in your work and, and what farmers may be seeing, and, but there's also, you know, there's some sort of layman's uh, evidence that it's working. So just want your comments on that. Um, the picture that I showed was, was um, a native prairie grass species versus an annual wheat. And I mean, the point of that was clearly uh, perennial species put a lot more root carbon down. So if root carbon is preferentially stabilized, we assume we're doing the whole system energetically and in terms of building soil organic matter that we're doing it a favor. Um, I guess the other comment I made was, can we nudge plant breeding toward an outcome for typical annual crops that are actually putting a bit more carbon below ground? There should be a return in efficiency on nutrient uptake uh, with a bigger and tighter functioning root system. Um, so I, I hope we're going there. We have a big initiative going on at the university right now where we're look, sort of phenotyping the root microbiome of a bunch of um, wheat and canola founder lines, like a diversity panel, to try to see you know, what are the genes in these parental lines of annual field crops that might be contributing to a, a, a beneficial microbiome so that that can be incorporated directly into, into modern breeding programs because um, right now below ground dynamics really aren't accounted for directly at all by breeders. Um, in terms of looking at pasture systems and native prairie and benchmarking, um, 
I have two students working in a pasture system right now looking at microbial dynamics and they're part of a really much larger project looking at uh, basically what is the impact of incorporating non-bloat legumes into an alfalfa grass mix and um, with the intention of improving cattle feed use efficiency, reducing enteric methane, but then what's the net impact on the system in terms of carbon storage and greenhouse gas emissions? And they are so tricky to work in because there's so much spatial variability. Just the badgers and ground squirrels alone are making us crazy, right? So it's really hard to get robust measurements, even in a constrained research system that accurately account and verify carbon change because we're trying to measure small changes in a huge background within a pool that we know needs to go like this, right? The, the, the available active carbon needs to change and flow and fluctuate. And so when and where and how do we measure soil carbon that reflects the long-term change and not the rain two days ago or, you know, so I think that's the challenge that as researchers we're really struggling with is, is accurate measurement and verification of soil carbon change. We were struggling with it 20 years ago. It's frustrating. Um, microbial communities are equally as variable, so uh, I, don't have an, I don't have an answer. Benchmarking's tricky for sure for those reasons. Thank you for having me.